Today we're going to talk a little bit about A-list partners, which is an equity fund. It's a security file with the uh, SEC, and it's a lot different than a debt fund. So, as you, many of you may know, for years I built a very large debt fund here in Austin, part of Austin. Uh, ended up retiring in December. That lasted three weeks. I was bored out of my gourd and said, no, I'm not going to do this, so let's start another fund. So I didn't want to compete with Pride of Austin because I still got a substantial amount of money invested in Pride of Austin. So I said, well, they're a debt fund. How about let's do an equity fund? Because there's really no equity funds operating in Austin. There's a lot of debt funds. And debt funds are now having to fight each other for loans, or good, good interest-bearing loans, which is fine, but I don't want to be in that me melee of, of fighting for loans. So we, we're doing a debt fund, and we're going to explain the difference as we go along. Um, <clears throat> here's some ways you can contact us. We have a pretty large digital footprint. So, Jordan, you can go in deep. No, I will Okay. <laughs> Not going to disturb me. You need water or anything? Okay. okay. At any rate, um, I'm, I'm real good host. I want to make sure everyone's happy. <laughs> we have a pretty large digital footprint. You can Google any term, A list, you know. David Owen, whatever, you're going to find a lot of information on us. It's all good. Um, that much I can guarantee you. You know, I've had investigations done by FBI agents, by security agents for the Treasury Department, and they're all investors in the fund, so that must say something, right? Um, and even Gary's friend, uh, she's an attorney here in Canada. <laughs> you know, uh, Susan stood up one day at a lunch and learned, she goes, and I had these guys investigated, <laughs> and I know they're good. And David drives a Prius. He doesn't waste money. <laughs> I just, David, I, if you remember when she first came to breakfast, uh -huh. she brought her investment. Yes. Sure yes, she did. That was the funniest thing. Mr. Was he with Merrill Lynch or Morgan Stanley or One something? Thing. Yeah. He's like, I can't get those returns. And I said, but I can. Uh, and I did. And she's been very happy for years in that time. So um, it's a Regulation D security filed with the SEC. Basically, that means that we have to find, you know, every, every investor has to meet a criteria to become an investor in the fund. Reg D means we're allowed to have unlimited number of, of, of um, accredited investors and we're limited to 35 non-accredited investors. Accredited would be someone who makes 200000 a year or more uh, or has a million dollars net worth or more and uh, everyone else would be non-accredited. But we're going to change that a little and I'm going to explain what we're going to do with the growth of our fund. Um, we have a great management team, and unlike Pride of Austin, which is Rob and myself. Um, I put together a 10-person team. Uh, some of them are here. Jordan is here. Uh, Wade is here. Andy's here. Josh is here. And then I have what I call investor ambassadors that are great people. Two of them are here, Morris and Barbara. They get out and they talk to their friends and they go on cruises and they hand out information all about us. <laughs> And the money they make from the funds pays for their cruises. So. <laughs> but they, hey, Sharon, come on in. This, this is like church. If you walk in late, I'm going to make sure everyone knows. <laughs> How are you doing? Um, Help yourself to food, please. Thank you. And Sharon is another an invest, uh, uh, of one of our, our ambassadors for investor relations. So her husband, Hector, is an ex FBI agent. So. One of one of the many that investigated. <laughs> I bet it did. I bet he was a tough dad. Yeah. <laughs> I would not want to be his son. Anyway, um, so we have a our manager team runs from the twenties up to my age, which is more than twenty, and <laughs> and uh, one of the questions I used to get all the time at Pride of Austin, what happens when you get ready to retire? When you, Every investor in that fund asked me that question at some point or another. So when I put this management team together, I want it to be multi-generational so that I can train all 10 of these guys at the same time. And if something does happen to me, it's not going to be disastrous to the fund. They can step in and replace me and take it over. So if I'm on life support systems, the fund continues to go. And it would be, we're setting it up so that it has continuity over decades to come. And that's the way this fund's been organized. Uh, just like I did at Pride of Austin, very conservative on our, our investing principles, how we underwrite a project. And it has to make a lot of sense to me, or I'm not even going to look at it. Basically, I won't look at properties that I can't get like a, almost a 20% ROI or better. 
off that property. Welcome. Um, so the management company is a little different. Now, on, on Pride of Austin, those of you that are familiar with it, it has a 2% management fee that the fund pays to Pride of Austin Capital Partners. Our management fee is 5%, and here's why. Pride of Austin Capital Partners, 2% management fee, plus they charge marketing, web design, web maintenance, office space, telephones. They charge back to the fund all of the operating expenses. But what I said to myself was that makes no sense to me, so we're just gonna do a 5% management fee and we pay all of the overhead out of that 5%. So the fund knows exactly what its expense is every year, 5% of whatever the assets under management are. Our assets under management are calculated based upon the actual asset value that we have cash invested into. So um, some funds will say, you know, oh, we have a million dollar project and they'll list that as a million dollar asset on their balance sheet. Our fund says, no, we've got 500000 in that project, so that asset is 500000 Does that make sense? Because we haven't realized the equity yet. And in, in a debt fund, you never realize the equity. So why do, you want to, why do you want to promote that as part of being your asset under management? That doesn't make sense to me either. But anyway, that's a little difference between debt and equity funds. Um, the way this fund is set up, it's an 8% preferred return to our investors, and then it's a 70-30 split on the profits after that. So the preferred 8% goes to the investors, and then the management company makes 30% of the profits after that, and the investors get 70% of the profits after that. So it, we're, we're, we're aiming for that 12 to 15 percent range every six months on an annualized basis going back to the investors. And I think that we're going to hit it almost every six months. Um, we're going to convert to a regulation A+. This is a new regulation the SEC has allowed for private funds to, to register as. And the reason we're making this conversion is for is for a lot of reasons. One, we can then advertise openly. Right now, Reg D Security cannot put a billboard out that says, hey, A-List Partners, REI Fund. That's you know frowned upon by the SEC. But with we, we, A+, plus, we can advertise openly. We can put ads in the paper. We can put billboards out. We can you know, do, adult, do a lot of things for marketing. The other reason is we can utilize crowdfunding. That's kind of a new way it's coming with a lot of the millennials and, and, and Gen X and Gen Y people. They love that crowdfunding platform because they go, oh, I can put a thousand here and a thousand here and a thousand. I mean, they, they just get off on it. It's kind of like their adrenaline. So we're going to utilize crowdfunding. Reg A Plus allows us to, to raise up to 20 million a year through crowdfunding. And the third reason we're going to go to a Reg A Plus is because it allows us 500 non-accredited investors as opposed to 35. So that's important to us because there's a lot of millennials that have not yet become an accredited investor. And they would like to get involved in a fund like ours. And, and a lot of times they can't because they don't, they don't meet that threshold. So we're going to convert to an A plus and that's, how, that's the reasons why we're converting. It's not, not going to change anything as far as the returns to the investors. It's more of a legal status that we're changing with the SEC. The cost to the fund is minuscule. It's just filing an addendum. Uh, to it, just like what we did on our, we filed a Reg S uh, overlay, which means that we're allowed to take in foreign nationals into this fund. That Reg S filing was only a $4,000 hit to us, you know, um, but now we're allowed to bring in foreign nationals into the fund. Legally. Can I ask a question real quick? Sure. What was, what was your thinking about getting into Reg D at the beginning rather than the Reg, the reg A? Because Reg A is a new, a new regulation. Oh, okay. Yeah. They just came out with, they actually started investigating it or promoting it about a year ago, and they're allowing the first conversions this fall. We're gonna be one of the very first funds to convert. So that's the reason. Um, so we began in March of this year. This is our six month anniversary, yay. You know, <laughs> I'm happy about that because when I put my pro forma out, I told everyone in our first year, which ends you know, March 31st, 2016, I expect to have about $5 million in assets under management. We, we are 100,000 shy at the end of August of hitting that. We've already hit it for September. So basically, we're six months ahead of our growth. My $10, $10 million mark was gonna be our second anniversary. We're probably gonna hit that by December. 
This is a massively growing security, and we're happy with it, very happy. So just like the Reg D, you know, it's a 20-year initial term with 10-year renewables, you know, so, so I'm not going to be managing it for 20 years, I don't think, you know, unless God gives me all this great energy for the rest of my two more years, but um, these younger people will be. And so that this fund's going to stay, and, and after, after 10 years, they can renew it. The management team decides they want to renew it. They just renew it for another 10 years. And then after that, they have to go to the investors and go, do you guys want to keep going? And then it's a 10-year renewal you know, from there. So 30 years is going to be uh, basically the management team decision. And then after that, it's 10-year renewables based on what the investors want to do in the fund. In other words, we can liquidate it or we can keep it going. So just like a debt fund, it's 100% owned by the investors. Um, the management company does not particularly own a percentage of it other than what our investment is into the fund. Yes, the management company has an investor in the fund. So we have our money in the fund. Um, the investments basically are two-year commitment. So think of it in terms of buying a two-year CD at your bank. But that's the way you get high yields. You don't get high yields by going in and putting money in one month and taking it out the next month. No bank's going to give you a high yield on that. Well, I don't think any bank's going to give you much of a yield other than here's your penny. You know, that's a whole nother lunch in there. That's my favorite one. Here's your penny. And if you haven't heard me say that or deliver that one, it's probably the best nighttime television you'll ever watch because um, it's funny. Anyway, and I really come after the big banks. I show all their dirt. So <laughs> they don't like that. Anyway. Um, as an investor, you can get semi-annual financial statements. One thing I believe in is transparency. I don't like to hide anything from our investors. All you got to do is ask for it, and it's going to go to you. Just it's that simple. It's not a hem haw. Let me think about it. Let me you know. Let me you know talk to everyone about it before I send it out. You want it? Call Wade. He'll do it. You know. You don't even have to come through me. Anyway, semi-annual finance, tax returns upon request. You know, if you want to see our tax return, you'll see everything but the Schedule K-1s. I cannot share that with you, it's private information. But we can show you the actual tax return other than the K-1s. The K-1s is what you, each individual investor gets, so I can't let everyone know what people have involved invested in the fund. We're gonna uh, actually audit this fund starting this year. It's not a lot to audit, but we're gonna do it anyway because I believe in auditing, you know. Um, it troubles me that some funds are not audited, and, and there is an expense in auditing a fund, but it's an expense well worth incurred because it gives every investor peace of mind. And so we're going to be auditing this fund. So probably the first you know few weeks of the year, we'll find a time for the auditor to come in, and Wade will be working with them, and I'll still be doing what I do. <laughs> you know, I'll be on Wade's phone show. Yes, sir. Is it an audit or is it a review? We're going to do an audit. Full mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and that's a good point, Gary, because it's not just you know a bunch of loans sitting in a file cabinet. We actually have assets. So they're going to have to really look at a lot of information. And I'd, I'd really rather have that. You know, I really would. You know, it, it, it saves me from a number of phone calls through the year from investors going, why isn't the fund audited, you know? And so I'm just going to do it and be done with it. And I'd rather, I'd rather, I'd be happier that way. Um, all of our files for every asset is loaded up to Dropbox. You have, you have the right to call Wade or me or Andy or Josh or anyone, Jordan and say, I'd like to have access to the Dropbox files, and you will get access to every asset file. You are welcome to look at everything that we have, every document that we have on every asset we have in the portfolio. I'm fine with that, it's not a problem. Again, we want full disclosure. So return your investments, as I mentioned earlier, you get a preferred rate of 8%, and then you're gonna get 70% of the net profits beyond that. So we're looking at in that 12 to 15 percent range. There's no front end load fee. So if you go buy stock in Ford, you know they've already priced in a front end load fee on that, that that price per stock that you're paying. You know, so in other words, you're already at 105 percent over the value of the stock on that day that you bought it. Um, we don't do front end load fees. Semi annual distributions, and you'll get a statement of your account or a check. 
they just come out to you automatically. Wade is working on a program to do ACH transfer, so if you want to, if you prefer receiving your income as opposed to reinvesting your distribution, we're going to set it up hopefully where you can, and it may not be by, by January, but pretty soon after that we'll have it. Just, you just get a text message that says such number of dollars is deposited in your account, your statement's in the mail. We're very much automating this. The best thing about hiring young people is I don't have to learn technology. They know. <laughs> yeah. And so that's why I have a multi-generational team. Because there's a lot of things I really don't want to learn at 62 years old. <laughs> um, but our, our investment portfolio is going to be mostly real estate development. You didn't put that. Fix and flips and... It's the next line down. Oh, sorry. Remodel edition. <laughs> I, my note had added up. Uh, okay, so fix and flips, remodel additions. There's a difference between this. Fix and flips basically cosmetic. You know, carpet, paint, blah, blah, blah. Hey, guy, long time. Like I told Sharon, when you come late, it's like coming to church. I'm going to point you out. <laughs> <laughs> and I could say that because I used to be a Catholic priest. So I would always, even when they come late to, to Mass, I would go, hey, welcome. Come on up, there's a seat right here. <laughs> People didn't come late to my masses. Um, New spec home construction, purchasing REO properties from private lenders. This is how we picked up 11 properties real fast. And this is another reason why I wanted an equity fund over a debt fund. There's a lot of debt funds who have REO properties in their portfolio. They're not property managers. They're bankers. So they don't really know what to do with it. Well, we do. So we went, we're gonna go in and take those properties. There's already 30, 35, 40% equity in those properties. We just take it over, put it into our assets, and then finish out the project and get it sold. So the profit becomes ours as opposed to sitting dormant in a debt fund and them not knowing what to do with it. So this is a real big thing that helped us launch. We picked up 11 properties in San Antonio just from one lender. Um, and then we're going to talk about EB-5 securities in a minute. It's a whole different ballgame. We've never mentioned it at a debt fund presentation, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to get, you're going to be excited when I talk to you about EB-5. So that's basically how we bring assets into the fund. Um, you can use cash to invest. You can use whatever's sitting in your bank, under your mattress, whatever. I mean, <laughs> I'm surprised there are actually people that have cash on hand. <laughs> <laughs> Which you don't see much of these days. Anyway, <laughs> you can use your self-directed retirement account. You know, um, we do a lot of work with uh, self-directed IRA services out of Waco and Equity Trust out of Ohio. So you're welcome to you know use whatever custodian you want with your IRA. But we do that. You can actually transfer title of real estate. So if you have property free and clear, you got property with a lot of equity in it and has an underlying debt, and you are tired of it, give us a call. We'll look at it. We might we may go in and pay off the underlying debt and give you an equity share as a subscription agreement into the fund. So you can actually use that. Or if you have an equity position in a real estate project, we'll look at that. We may we may swap that into a subscription agreement. Foreign nationals are accepted. Like I said, we, we filed our Regulation S. Our EB-5 visa qualification, I'm going to go into detail in a minute. And our portfolio interest tax exemption. This is for foreign investors. Um, the United States government allows foreign investors to bring money into the United States and put it into another situation with an American bank. And it's interest-free money that goes, or I should say tax-free interest money that goes back to that investor. So the U.S. does not tax that money for them. They don't have to come here and get a U.S. tax number. It's just simply a note situation between a foreign investor and a U.S. company. And then the U.S. company sends some money through wire service overseas. We declare it as an expense, just like an interest expense on a loan. And, and they make money tax-free out of the United States. There's a lot of people looking to do that because their money's not making them any money in their countries. We've already started our network of working through Mexico, Central America, South America, Canada, and Kuwait. So an EB-5 regional center. Um, the EB-5 program allows for foreign nationals, basically it's a legal pro 
pro prospect for them to actually buy a green car. So they come in, they put in anywhere from a half million to a million dollars into a U.S. asset, and they get fast-tracked into the green car situation. So we set up uh, a team that works with them, besides our securities attorneys, there's an immigration attorney that works with them, and as soon as they register, that immigration attorney is working with them, getting them registered for their green card. They'll get a provisional green card real fast, and then every year it's renewed until about the third or fourth year, and then it becomes permanent. So an EB-5 security is their investment that has to be invested in the U.S. into a, a development for a period of three to five years. And then when that development cashes out, the security is dissolved, the investors get their money back, they've earned their interest on it, and the developer who put it together is pretty much going to have cheap money. So the way we're structuring ours is our developers will get a 6% interest rate, and then it'd be 3% of that will be a management fee, and 3% is interest paid to the EB-5 investors, and the investors also get a 10% equity position in that development. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot of money to you and I, but when you consider that Trammell Crow pays them one quarter of 1%, and if it's a bust, they take that money, they take that loss and, 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 and pull the money away from the investors, and they, they are the ones who have to pay for that loss. So a lot of your bigger developers are basically using this as really cheap money, and um, they're not really being very fair to the, the foreign nationals. Our purpose of doing better than anyone else, 3% is going to be the highest rate of any EB-5 program out there. And our purpose of that is simple this. We're building investors into the main fund for the future. Because three to five years from now, that half million to a million dollars is going to have to go back somewhere, because it has to come out of the, the EB-5 security, and it either goes back to them, to their country, or it could be <coughs> invested into the REI fund. So we're building future investors through the EB-5 program. And if we treat them real nicely, they, they're not about to say, no, we don't want to put money with you. We want us to keep money. You know, they're, going to, they're going to want to. Our first one is a $30 million project in East Austin, 75-unit development. Our application deadline is April 30th. The two guys that are handling that are Wade and Josh. They're working with the developer on that, putting together all the documents, getting it to the economist. And uh, our, the economist does about 90% of these EB-5 funds in the nation. Our immigration attorneys do a, quite a number. We'll have a number at the end of the month exactly how much money we can bring in from EB-5 investors. And then A-List Partners is the one who uh, bridges that gap. So let's say it's a 10 million, the loan amount's gonna be 10 million. Let's say we bring in 8 million through EB-5 investors. A-List Partners does the $2 million difference. We take the first lien. So on a $10 million loan, we actually are a 20% loan to value ratio. Does that make us in good shape? Absolutely, considering that the property has a $4.5 million as is value now. So we're in real good shape. But, and then we control the money that through the developer and they do draw some as they develop and, and construction. This particular one's not only going to be horizontal development, but also going to be vertical development. Mm -hmm. So it'll be 75 garden homes up to three stories tall in <coughs> Boston, 12th and Hargrave, a mile and a half from downtown. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're looking at, Josh, what is it? Like 300 a foot? 300 a square foot. How much? 300 square foot. 300 square foot is the market value today for these. They're going to be anywhere from 1,700 to 2,200 square foot homes. Is that right? Then there's a piece in front that actually faces 12th Street that would be a commercial development. So it'd be like a, a phase of this development. And there's an opportunity for us to pick up another tract of land on the back side that would be a phase two. So if we do that, it'd be more like a 50, 60 million dollar project as opposed to a 30 million dollar. But all the while, A-List Partners REI Fund and A-List Partners Management controls the flow of money. Oh, and by the way, you know, there's a 25% equity participation for the fund for doing all this. So we... <laughs> yeah, 25%. I mean, this is going to be about a seven, eight million dollar uh, equity situation. So 25% of that becomes the fund's money. Um, Okay, management team, I already introduced some of them, but basically that's who you are. Um, Morris, Barbara, Hector, who is Sharon's wife, and then Sharon. I mean, Sharon's husband, sorry. Don't tell him I said that. 
So here's one. Here is the very first project that we just finished. It's, it's, uh, we picked it up for 435,000. It's in Alamo Heights, San Antonio. The house is 2,800 square feet and had a basement. So if you've known me a while, you know how creative I can be when I look at stuff. So I said, no, that's not a basement. That's an apartment. It's 900 square feet of, of space that was never utilized. Stan and Tom, well, more Stan. Stan was our contractor on that one. And uh, it was a lot of work because we had to go in and read. This is, a, this is an example of what people do when they watch too much late night television on fix this house situation. Because Stan had to remove four layers of tile. Tile laid on top of tile, laid upon top of tile. Oh, and the third, the bottom layer was actually engineered wood, right? Yes. <laughs> it was a nightmare. And they had this great tongue and groove um, uh, wood ceiling. They covered it up with sheetrock, but we managed to save it downstairs in the apartment. So we have a 900 square foot apartment and a 2,800 something square foot main house. All total, four bedrooms, four and a half baths. It's a beautiful home. But, um, we created an exterior, you know, I'll show you in a minute. Here, I'll show you now, thank you. Uh, I'll do the numbers on it, we'll come back to that. So, exterior shots, but this is what the side house looked like. This was a solid slab. And I said, no, let's excavate this, put a stairway down, and have an outside entrance into that apartment because the only way to get to that apartment previous to this was a little spiral staircase going down a six by maybe five foot entrance. Four or five, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. you couldn't even get furniture down there. Um, so when we got it, the kitchen looked like this and we turned it into that. Um, the bed, that was an extra bedroom. Had horrible engineered wood. Um, Stan can tell you it was a complete nightmare. There was no backer board behind this tile anywhere, and there was no membrane underneath this shower floor. So whoever had bought this, had these people finished the project, they would have had water leaking into their kitchen underneath this. Anyway, master bath became from this to that. You have to take out a lot when you do a, a fix and flip because you have to fix somebody else's problems. Um, we have that house listed now for 835. It just went on the market the 1st of August, or the first part of August. Uh, it's had a lot of showings, no contracts offers on it yet. The, uh, we're waiting for one more thing to happen to get the gas meter installed, and once it's installed, then we're actually going to blow up our marketing on it. But um, it takes a little while to get the utility companies in San Antonio to, to work. It's really odd because in Austin, the utility companies work really fast, and in San Antonio, they will get back to you, you know, whenever. And it, the reverse is true. You can get a permit in San Antonio in a matter of days, and it takes months to get a permit to build in Austin. So another home we're building is uh, Garden Square. It's also in Alamo Heights, about 2,900 square feet, three bedroom, three bath, three and a half bath. Uh, it's a great home. Um, they'll probably finish this one by the end of the month. In mm -hmm. September? Yeah, yeah any, Tom, any week think, now. Yeah, done. Tom, but they're on schedule. Yeah, Tom's, he's right on schedule. Um, again, there was a lot of problems with it. You know, you had to go in and, and redo the problems that someone else created for you. But it's okay. It's part of what we do. Now, this is going to be a very interesting conversation we're going to have right now. You can say to yourself, I can do my own fix and flips. And I know David left, but I can see him shaking his head about the problems with the fix and flip. You know? Um, you, you're right. You can invest and do your own fix and flip. There's nothing wrong with that. The question then becomes, do you want the headache of doing that fix and flip? Do you want the headache of doing new construction? Do you want the headache of doing remodel and addition? And then ask yourself, you're doing one project, whereas a fund like ours, we're gonna be doing 20 houses just this year. So our economies of scale are big, di majorly different. You're paying almost retail for everything you put into your little one house. Whereas, you know, we're getting volume discount everything from the nails all the way through the rest of the house because we're building so many. So our profit margins are better. I'll tell this little story about Anthony Schott. Anthony, he used to be the comptroller at Newmark Homes and a great friend, you know, I did a lot of work with him. But Anthony said, I can build homes just as good as Newmark can. But he forgot the economy of scale. And so he was in Alamo Heights doing these remodel additions 
And his average net profit per home that he was doing was 4 to 5 percent. And he couldn't understand why his expenses were so much greater. And I go, because Newmark is building hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of homes, and you're building this. You know? So you may be using the same trade that Newmark is using, but they're, they have been able to negotiate a lot better <coughs> pricing. So when he put his pro forma together, he was like at an 18 to 20% ROI. And I go, you're not going to get it. You know, I'll, I'll get behind you, but you're not going to get it. You know? So we argued about that. And he built the house, and it came out a little over, a little over 4%. You know, and that's a little hard to split with an investor when your profit margin is so low. So it's real important to understand that you can do knockoffs and one-on-ones all you want to do, but if your economy is scaled in there, your profit margin is not going to be there. So I just thought I'd throw that out there in case you watch too much late night television. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds so easy. You know, you see these really model like guys and girls that are just you know having fun doing houses and oh, I can do that but you really can't not the way they can you know so Garden Square uh, I'm not going to go through a lot of the details unless you want them Donaldson we are pretty much we have a buyer already interested in me I started on it uh, we're working on the budget with the buyer this is in the historic district of San Antonio Ala Monticello 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 okay. Monticello Monticello, mm -hmm. anyway. Um, Alban Drive is about three weeks away from being finished. Yeah, another nightmare. <laughs> no backer board behind the tile, you know. <laughs> Electrical problems. Okay, explain to me this. You have, this is an older home, so that the, the, the service panel is on the exterior on the patio side. Right? And a lot of older homes you see they're in the garage or on the exterior of the house anyway, right? Okay. They thought they'd, they'd be really smart to move it and they put it inside the linen closet of the master bathroom. What's the problem with that? Fire, oh, Fire hazard. <laughs> Just, you know, linen closet, sparking little breakers. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are they thinking? I should do a reality TV show and walk through these properties and go, what are they thinking? Because, I mean, some people have no brain whatsoever, and they should not be in that business. So we took it over. We're, we're, we're making it right. Had a, oh, here's another problem. This is the funniest thing. So they put up sheetrock, right? Sheetrock's a lot of work if you've ever hung sheetrock. It's a lot of work. They put it up, they textured it, they painted it, and then they said, wait a minute, we forgot about the AC. <laughs> <laughs> So our AC contractor had come through and cut through sheetrock to put the registers in, and it was a lot of work not to not to break the sheetrock and step through it. It was a, it was time consuming and very labor intensive. But there's some people that should just not be in this business at all. Leave it up to the fund, and, and you'll make a lot of money. Let us take that money and put it to work. Um, Morningside's a duplex over by Fort Sam Houston. Uh, yeah, Fort Sam Houston's right here, and here's Morningside. So it's a little duplex, three bedroom, three bath. Uh, duplex, both sides are three bedroom, three. Easy to rent. We'll probably get this one out middle November, get it rented, sell it off to an investor. There's a lot of investors in Austin that are moving down to San Antonio with their money because you can't buy anything in Austin these days, really. There's a lot of money moving to San Antonio looking for rental properties. We'll have that one sold before we finish it. If you're interested, I'll be glad to talk to you. <laughs> Hathaway, this is an interesting house. So it's a very unusual house. The layout's very unusual. It's an L-shaped home, about a little over 1,600 square feet. And then it has a, a front courtyard that's been completely screened in. So it becomes a square. It's got a flat roof, built in the 50s, a very modernistic little home. But there's something very interesting about it. So our architect was there looking at it with this because we wanted to you know, make it really nice. And he started thinking, this looks very familiar. The style, the, the arrangement, the layout, it looks familiar to me. So he went and did a little bit of investigation, found out it was designed by Milton Ryan, who is a very famous 50s architect in San Antonio. And there's a huge push to, to, to preserve his homes. 
there's what, five left in San Antonio? I think there was like five or six left. There's one church left that he had designed, and there's a, a small office building he designed. But I mean, he was probably one of the uh, quintessential modernist architects of his time. So now we have this Milton Ryan designed home that we're going to restore to Milton Ryan's, you know, the way he, the way he had designed it. And we'll put a, on the back side, we'll put a three car garage with a, a apartment above it, because this is also close to Fort San Houston. And so that apartment could be very rentable to a serviceman or a service couple. But we're gonna restore it to the vision of Milton Ryan. Now you're saying, well, so what? Well, what that means to us is, you just added a couple hundred thousand dollars to the equity in the home. And we're gonna get so much play out of it because the city of San Antonio, their historical board or whatever it's called, they're like, please restore this house. And they're gonna do this and this and this and this and just really make it, you know, they're gonna blow it up with publicity. So A-List is gonna get a lot of publicity on that house. Too bad the lender that sold it to us didn't know it was. They didn't, but we do. Uh, we, have, we bought three houses on Ritterman, which is in Terrell Hills next to Alamo Heights. Uh, these are gonna be massive remodel additions going from 14 to 1600 square foot homes up to 25 to 3000 square foot homes. So our, they're in architectural planning now, there's three of them. Um, they look like little mini homes. Terrell Road is a teardown. This is another situation. It was a beautiful home at one time, and the people got a hold of it and destroyed it. So they were gonna make it better, but they actually destroyed the house. They could have made a decent profit on that house if they had not gone in and taken out walls and taken out ceilings and taken out the roof and left it open to the, I mean, they had beautiful wood floors in there that are all ruined because the elements have gotten to them. And um, wasps could have taken over, and there must be <laughs> a thousand wasps in that house. But at any rate, um, there's nothing salvageable uh, from it, except for some of the windows that they had replaced and some door doors. interior doors. There's a few things like that. There's a new hot water heater in there. What we do is when we go to a house like this, we take out everything that we can salvage and put it into a storage unit. Maybe we can use it somewhere in a remodel that we're going to be doing in the future. I mean, down to door hardware, uh, back to all, um, back to Garden Square. You know, I'm a nut about our finishes being the same, so we have brushed nickel on most of the house and then a few little pieces <coughs> of, uh, of oil rub bronze for light fixtures and doorknobs and stuff. So we're taking out the oil rub bronze, putting that in the storage room, bringing in brushed nickel to finish the house out. So it just, it, when a buyer walks through a house, the one thing they don't want to see is mixed finishes. You just lost a buyer in most cases. Another mistake that a lot of people that watch uh, nighttime television the Terrell Hills is going to go down to the ground. What we're going to build there is a house about a million dollar home. So basically, we bought this for dirt value. It's not it, the house has no value. So we bought the house in Terrell, the, the, this property in Terrell Hill for dirt value. And a sister went to it on Bricker, same thing. We can't figure this one out at all because here's the front door. They had a lock on it. You know, this is real funny, I think. So they had a locking front door. And you walk around this corner, and this whole side of the house is open. <laughs> Do the roof. And the lock bumps. Uh, it's the funniest thing. Uh, again, new windows that we're salvaging out of it. The other one um, has uh, Austin stone on it. We're salvaging all that Austin stone, and we're actually going to use it in the new construction of the house we're going to build on Terra. Um, Again, about a million dollar home in Terrell Hills. You know, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. Somewhere between 900 and 1.2 million. But we bought these lots in fair value, so there's a lot of problem margin here. Tom's gonna be the builder on these. And Stan's his assistant, he has on these. It's interesting, Stan's lead I'll on some. There. And Stan's lead on some, and Tom's lead on some. Anyway. Um, Stovall, it went down today. You know, the house has been demolished. Again, it takes a while to get people off their, you know, but they're behind to get out there and work. Um, so we're building, this is in North Crestview, if you will, Lamar Anderson area. Uh, we bought two lots, contiguous lots together, 913, 915 Stovall. They're, the house is being demolished today, so we're gonna start construction pretty soon. Building twin condos on both properties, so we'll have a four unit 
complex, somewhere in the high fives to high six range on the market. New Brunswick spec homes. Tom brought this deal to me at first. I'm like, eh. But the more I looked at it, the more interested I got. Um, New Braunfels is the hottest area of Austin, I mean, of Texas right now for construction. People are moving there from all over, from Houston, El Paso, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin. They're going there because, well, for a lot of reasons. One, your tax rate is really, really low. And secondly, you know, they, their kids are not in school. They don't have to worry about their kids. And they want a quality of life and a really nice development. If you go into Houston, Dallas, whatever, you still got traffic to deal with. New Braunfels doesn't quite have the traffic yet, you know, but these are one acre home sites, really good opportunity for someone like Tom to go in and build some spec homes. So we're working with the developer now to take down a 15 lot commitment over the next 16 months, something like that. So we'll be building 15 spec homes over the next year and a half, two years in this uh, development. Um, so you add those 15, 16, plus our four in Austin, plus our 11 in San Antonio, in the next year and a half, two years, we become a major builder. You know? And we're our own clients. So there's a lot of equity coming into the fund. Yes, you could do a spec home with, with Tom. The problem is he's going to reprice the, the budget and treat you like a one-off. So when he does his budget, he's going to see, okay, this is a one-person buy, one person or one investor that's going to come in and it's going to be this one home, and I'm going to budget it according to that one home. But he's certainly not going to give them the same economy of scale he's given me to build 15 homes with him, right? I mean, why would a builder do that? <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, um, again, economy of scale, I think these are going to be pretty profitable depending on how large the home is. They're going to be anywhere from, I think, a low of 15% ROI to a high of about 22, 23% ROI. We're pretty happy with that. Um, the other good thing about this particular development is the, is the, the um, I don't know what his title is. Keith? What's his title? Whatever. Anyway, he's like he's like the marketing guy for this whole development. Anyway, um, he made the mistake of when Tom showed me this project. He got in his car and drove us around. He's like, "Oh yeah, I'll give you the list of property owners." And of course, in my mind, I'm going, "Okay, that's two thousand property owners that I now have access to." <laughs> These are probably all accredited investors that live in this area. So we're going to go out there and do a lot of marketing. Uh, Andy and Josh are probably the two most gifted guys that can talk to strangers and convince them to do something. So we're going to be doing, <laughs> doing some lunch and learns out in this development and uh, making our name really known. A lot of signage is going to go up with our, with our logos on it. Great exposure. We're happy with it. Uh, again, this is the 12th and Hargrave development. It's six acres currently, and it's being um, permitted with the 75 garden homes. We're very excited about this. The, the developer that brought this to us is a very seasoned horizontal developer, but he also is a vertical developer. So we're excited about being in partnership with him. Um, speaking of EB-5, this particular developer has a project out near Flint Rock Falls that we're looking at. I think it's um, 16 acres for a home site development that we're thinking about putting together another fund for that. And then Tom just brought us one in Dripping Springs that we're going to be looking at, um, putting together an EB-5 fund for it. When I say EB-5 fund, the way that it works is we have to actually establish a security and register a security for that one asset. And so the investors are only investing in that one asset, the foreign investors. It's not open to U.S. citizens. So you cannot invest in that particular fund. But if you want to participate in the profits from that project, that's why we have the REI fund. Um, so anyway, that, that's in East Austin. We're excited about that one. Um, this is another one that we're, we're really working on pretty hard. And people ask me all the time, why do I want to look at foreign investments? Well, I've been investing offshore for a long time. And it's, it's a great opportunity to earn money without having to pay taxes on that money. I like Costa Rica because it's a fee simple country 
In other words, unlike Mexico, where you have to hire some attorney that's probably going to rip you off and put your, your asset into a trust or you know, something like that, you, know, you actually can own the property. But they make it a, a, even a little more exciting for a foreign national to invest into their country. If you set up a Costa Rican LLC, it's roughly $1,000 to get it set up, and it's $500 a year for your business tax. If you set up one LLC for each property that you that you invest in or own in Costa Rica, when you sell it, there's no capital gains. They have that little rule that in one asset LLC, there's no capital gains to it. That's a lot of savings on taxes, which makes your bottom line pretty, pretty substantial. So when you look at stuff like that, I like that kind of stuff, and we've already started working with them on 23 units down there. It'd be two individual um, condominium units, each of them having their own LLC, and then we're doing a boutique hotel, which would be 21 beds. And it's like maybe 50 feet from the Pacific Ocean. And they have the management company, the property management company already in place. They, they take care of the reservations, you know, they take care of everything. We could turn it into a bed and breakfast, we can offer full packages, we could do a lot of things with our marketing on it, but we're really excited about it. Um, it's actually connected to what they're building now, which is called the Beach Club. And the Beach Club is basically, a, um, has restaurants, swimming pools, adult pools, children pools, uh, spas, exercise, I mean, a, a gym, <coughs> spa services. And it's right there on, as, as close as you can get to the beach in Costa Rica as they allow, which is 50 feet away. And I'll allow you to be closer than that. So we'll be doing, you'll be hearing about this a lot. We'll be launching it next month, putting together an, an LLC for each of the properties that we're gonna take down. You don't have to be an accredited investor in that. We're gonna use a lot of crowdfunding. A lot of young people are gonna be telling them this is the best kind of investment they can make. It's probably gonna be a minimum of two to $3,000 buy-in. So a lot of people can, can afford to get into it. The best part about it is you do not have to bring your money back to the United States. You can go down there on a vacation, right off your vacation, of course, because you're checking on your asset, right? And then you open up a bank account in Costa Rica, your just distributions, your earnings, will be deposited into that bank account. You can use your, your ATM card to bring it out over here if you want to, or you can go down there and bring it out and bring back $10,000 at a time you know, without incurring a repatriation 15% tax. Because that's what the U.S. charges to bring money back into the United States, 15%. So if we had put together your typical LLC that had multiple um, assets in it, you're paying the Costa Rican government 15% capital gains, and you're paying the U.S. government 15% to bring the money back, that eats into your profit margin substantially. And you can leave your money offshore and let it grow for you. you know? I mean, it's a great way to create a vacation place and not have to spend a lot of money on your vacation. So you'll be hearing a lot more about um, Las Catalinas from us. Uh, as we go along. Let's see. So at any rate, that's the end of my talk. Uh, Y'all have questions? David, what kind of, uh, what kind of rents are those, uh, those properties next to Fort Sam? Which ones? What kind of rents are anticipated to get from those properties? Morningside. Next to Fort I like Morningside. Um, you know, ten, we're looking somewhere in the fifteen hundred to two thousand range per sign. Okay. On that and one. those are what two threes? Those are all three threes. Three bedrooms. No, they're three bedrooms. Three yeah. yeah, three bedrooms. Three bedrooms, three baths. Three baths. Yeah. yeah, each bedroom has a bath. So it's a pretty nice little unit. But we're going to sell that off as a duplex and not economize it out. What we're going to do with Garden Square is um, we're going to put it on the market to sell it. But in the meantime, we're going to we're going to furnish it and put it into Airbnb because that location there it's got a pool in the back, uh, a little lap pool. It's a garden home, so you got a small backyard with a lap pool. Um, it's a great entertainment home. It's got a, it's got a um, pergola which we're going to put gas out there for grill and everything, uh, deck it out. It's going to be a great entertainer's home. So we're going to use that, put it in an Airbnb, probably bring it in somewhere between two and $300 a night in that location. So while we have it on the market, we'll be bringing in rental income for Airbnb. We may do that with Everest now. We haven't decided. 
but that's kind of my new marketing idea is if I can if I can do it, go ahead and put these properties immediately into an Airbnb situation so we have income coming in off them while we're marketing. I want to use your holding uh, the homes that you're flipping. Mm -hmm. This is kind of the under the five hundred K mark. How long is it you holding the product? You know, going from acquisition to disposition. Um, anywhere from six to nine months. Okay. We'd like to do it faster, but ramping up, we have to get our systems in place, and it takes us a little while to get get our systems going. So, um, I would say once you know, after we have a few more months' experience, we're probably looking in the four to six month range. Got it. Is there a big gap in your scope of works as far as variance goes? When you're kind of assessing on site right now, are you under ten percent? For what? I'm sorry. Scope of work. You know, when you're again property and you're valuing for acquisition, mm -hmm. and then you're actually getting into it and going through the process and the nitty mm -hmm. uh, Are you seeing that you guys are coming close to the evaluation is originally? Yes. Uh, we Wade runs for the deal analysis on every project before we buy it, and we're looking at that 20% mark. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't hit that or come close to that, we won't even look at it. So that's where we start. And we hope that if we start there, then we're going to come in at least north of 15%. There's always contingencies and unknowns that happen. But if we look, if we, if we from planning state or planning stage, we, we won't look at anything less than 20%, we're going to get in good shape. Well, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. There's still food over there. If you haven't eaten or you want to eat, please do. There's a lot of cookies and uh, let's have some dessert and coffee, drinks, whatever. Feel free to ask questions privately. I'd be glad to talk to you. I have a quick, uh, again, maybe I didn't hear everything right, but the, uh, the Costa Rica resort, <coughs> is that going to be a, sep a whole separate thing, separate from, from A-List Partners? How, how, does, how does that work? I mean, I'm sure. Well, A-List Partners management is not going to be an investor in it per se, but we will receive income off of it because we're going to participate in the equity for managing it. Does that make sense? Okay. So we, we're, put, we're not putting money out, but we're receiving money in on that particular And then a lot of our investors would like to be a part of that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So it will say Right. Yeah, yeah. A list partners management is a real estate broker. Yeah, yeah. I knew but I didn't yeah, we're, we're keeping as much money in house as we can. <coughs> Property management fees, real estate brokerage fees, all of that stays in house, which lowers our, our cost of the expenses of the properties. Um, by the way, that, that screen there on the, over to the corner, that's our, um, our new screen we're taking on trade shows. And actually, that space to the upper right will be where we do a, a loop PowerPoint presentation of all our networks. So that's what it's for. We were just yeah, we were just setting it up because we hadn't seen it yet. So Josh bought it and set that for us. It's gonna be nice. We'll make a nice presentation. Yeah. No other questions. We have plenty of room for non-accredited investors and yeah. A-list partners as it is. Um, and we only have to really worry about that for another two months because we'll be converted to the A-plus before the end of the year and then it's open, wide open. But right now there's plenty of room for non-accredited. Right, it's a, it's a subscription agreement, so the process would be if you're interested, you email one of us and ask us for the documents, and then we will send those documents to you, and then after you've had a chance to read them, you may have some questions about them, and we answer those questions, and then if you're ready to invest, just fill out a subscription agreement and send it back in with your funding. It's simple. If they want it,
but it's very important that you read the, the legal documents. I don't bring them with me. Again, SEC rules say I cannot sit down with you when I first, you know, when I make a presentation, they, it's frowned upon. So that's why you have to email me and ask for that. You know, if I were to take everyone's email address and send it out, I just violated the SEC rules. But I'll be glad to give you my card, or, or Jordan will, or Wade will, or somebody will. Uh, yes, Dave. Uh, Ten thousand, two years. Yeah. Now, if you have a situation where you need your money back out, because some people have an unforeseen medical emergency or something like that, the SEC allows us to do an early termination, and we don't have a termination. We don't hit you with a fee. Is there any? No, there's no front end. No front end fee. Nope. If you put in 10, you get 10, that's your account.